Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Give us this day a daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us, forgive them and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let your kingdom come, Father, let your kingdom come, Father, let your will be done on earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Holy, holy. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven. Let it be done. Right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us. Forgive us. As we forgive the ones who sin against us. Forgive them. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us. All the evil one, let your kingdom come. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Oh, kingdom, the power, the glory is yours. It's yours, it's yours, all yours, all yours. Forever and ever, the kingdom is yours. It's yours. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Father, let your kingdom come. Father, let your will be done. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. On earth as in heaven, right here in my heart. Yeah, everything you did for me, 
Savior of the world, Jesus, King of all kings, Jesus, name above all names, Jesus. We lift your name up, Lord.
of the Lord this morning. I know the Lord is here, and this is the second time that I've come over here to preach, and uh, you'd have thought that the song, uh, the, the praise team, and, uh, Brother Barry had gotten my notes, amen, uh, that the worship went so much with what I want to tell you about today. Uh, I want to talk to you, it's a line right out of the Lord's Prayer, Matthew the 6th chapter, verses 9 through 14. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I'm going to pause for a moment as we go back over some of this. Many of us have said this prayer all our lives, even before we were Christians. And me knows what I'm talking about. Some of you, have, have you ever just said this like a robot? Thought this is something religious you say and didn't even know God? You've been there? I think some of us have known what that is like, to say such a powerful prayer and not even really know Jesus as our personal Savior. But you know, we are a spiritual being having a human experience. We're not a human having a spiritual experience. We are a spirit being having a human experience. Somebody said, sometimes my experience is more human than I want it to be. <laughs> Y'all with me on any of that? And so, moving on, it says, you know, in verse 9 and 10, in this set of scriptures, it talks about our connection with the submitting of our life to seek his kingdom on earth. We live on earth. We know there is heaven. We know there is a God. We know where he is. We know everything is perfect. There's no more sorrow. There's no crying. There's no problems in heaven. We center ourselves under heaven and ask daily, Lord, let it be here on earth like it is in heaven. This spiritual being that's having a human experience asks God of our spirit to come and let it be on earth like it is in heaven. Now the next thing it addresses is we are a physical being <coughs> in need of provision and a provider. In the ark, the ark of the covenant, they had three things. Y'all remember what that was? The tablets, Aaron's rod, and a jar of manna. Okay, his tablets, they represented God's policy. Here's what you do and do not do. Then Aaron's rod that budded represented God's power. They didn't know that rod was a limb that was stripped and and sanded and made into a rod to walk with, a rod that could be used for a weapon, a rod, that, uh, a rod that many of the men of the Middle East at that time didn't go anywhere without their rod. But one day, God made this rod bud. It supernaturally, dead wood came alive. <laughs> Amen? Kind of like in the book of Isaiah, where it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw also the Lord, who was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the doorpost shook. That wood had been cut, dried, smoothed, polished, and there it was. And when the train of God came through, that dead wood shook. Are you listening to me? God is powerful. There's a power about God that is unexplainable. This young man that testified talked about it. God is good. Don't even start. Amen. That doesn't even start with what God is. To many people, that's all God is is good. But listen, I'm telling you, he's more than that. We are a relational being in need of giving and receiving forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is such a vital part of what God does because we're humans. Why would we even need this scripture if we weren't going to need to give and receive forgiveness? Why is it one of the main scriptures that God said to pray if we weren't going to be people that made mistakes and had mistakes made to us? Not just mistakes, vicious, ugly things done to us by others that hurt us. Why would we need forgiveness except God said, you've got to have it. Because if you give forgiveness and you receive forgiveness, you keep the world washed out of your head, washed out of your heart. I said washed. I know it's spelled W-A-S-H-E-D, but I spell it W-A-R-S-H-E-D. Yes, I spell winders, winder. I know I'm in the right place because if there ever was a redneck church, this is one of them. Some of you, your, your grandmother had a spit cup on her ironing board. Some of you got at least three relatives named Bubba. Some of you, I know Suge, he's got, <laughs> he's got a welcome mat that says, not without a warrant. <laughs> His first paying job was he got a quarter to be the lookout. I know I'm at home here when I talk about some of our redneck ways. Whenever you're, when you're, whenever you're uh, praise and worship leaders wearing a feed store cap, we know we're in the right place. Amen? When he says we're going to start the service, he starts like he's starting up a Harley knucklehead. Uh, we know we're at home. I hope y'all are all right with that. I've just spread around some compliments. <laughs> forgive us our debts as we forgive our debt doors. One little girl after the They had a vacation Bible school centered on the Lord's Prayer. She got up at the end and said, Forgive us our trash passes as we forgive those that pass trash against us. (laughs) I think she she was on to something. Amen? You know, we are an emotional being in need of emotional guidance and health. I've heard people say, well, I don't go to church to get emotional. Some of that stuff people do with all this praising and all, that's all emotion. And I, I've heard people say, I'm just not an emotional being. You know what I want to tell them? You give me your credit card for an hour and I'll get some emotion out of you. <laughs> we're an emotional being. We're a spiritual being, a physical being, a relational being, and we're an emotional being. We're even a financial being because something's going to have to happen for us to be able to put food on the table. We're going to have to trade our work. Our, there's an economy there that works where we have a roof over our head and food on our table because we're putting something into it. to get. We're a financial being, and God's saying this, I want it on earth like it is in heaven. I want you to understand what heaven is like. And then it says, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine, I want y'all to get this, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Now, I, I'm, I'm getting a little worked up from the very beginning on this, and I hope, I hope it's all right with y'all if I just give it all I got with all my heart. I'm fixing to preach about something I don't know very much about, something I can't really explain. Pastor Wayne, I got three pages on what I couldn't explain. About the kingdom, you see in the the scriptures, 1 Samuel 8, 9 through 19, you don't have to put all that up there. I'm just telling you about where this came from. The people of Israel wanted a king. The other nations have got a king. Why can't we have a king? Boy, that kind of stuff doesn't change, does it? They got one. Oh, no, our neighbor's got a swimming pool. My thought is, let's use theirs. But... You know how it goes. Oh, we got to have one because they got one. No, we don't have to have one because they got one. You know, I was, on, I was, I was in a plane on a golf scramble, and a guy said, try this, and he handed me his new uh, tailor-made stealth, you know. And uh, I popped one, and I mean, for an old man, I popped it. In fact, they had to use my drive. And he said, you're going to have to buy you one of those. They're on sale for two ninety nine. <laughs> I said, why well, should I buy one when you got one? Amen. <laughs> I, 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 
I, I didn't get to where I, I got money in the bank because I'm stupid. I just don't have to buy because everybody else has got one. Now they got one. Why should I? Amen. Uh, just be friends. <laughs> uh, but when it comes to a government, you know, all these other countries got a government. Why can't we have one? Why, they got a king. Let's have a king. This judge business is not working. Well, I can pretty much tell you it wasn't working very good. Why? Because they're human. So they want a king. Okay, what's going to change? They're still going to be human. Samuel tried to tell them, like, when you all become a kingdom, here's how it works. The king's in charge of everything. He just lets you have. Everything you own belongs to him, and he lets you use it. If you pay 10% of everything that comes in, you can use your land. You can do this. This is the way it is with the kingdom. So you need, is that really what you all want? After he got through telling them why they shouldn't have, give us a king. Okay. So God said, okay, Samuel, we're going to let him have one. How many knows from that point forth, everything in Israel rose and fell with what kind of king they had? All those kingdoms, it's, it's the, the, the history of the Israeli kings is crazy. The only, the only thing about it is every king of every country, the history of them is are crazy. Because absolute authority corrupts absolutely. Man cannot handle they cannot handle absolute authority. One man cannot handle it. All he ends up with being a puppet for a bunch of crooked people around him. Well, we won't go into that. But Samuel tried to warn them what it was like to have a king. Reason why is there is only one that was ever worthy to be a king. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we pray, we say, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. He's the only one I trust. I pray for Washington, but I trust Jesus. Amen. I'm a law-abiding citizen, and I love America, America, and it's worst. It's still the best country on the face of the earth. But I am concerned about America, but I trust Jesus. Jesus is bigger than than America. Jesus is bigger than, and, and, and trying to explain how all this works, you've got to understand that we're in his kingdom and he has a system. I think that one of the ways of maturing in God is, is getting to the fact that there is a system in the word of God by which you live to where you get the benefits of that kingdom. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For to come to God, you must believe two things. Number one, He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. So that pretty much, that's kind of a nutshell version of how we should live. To live a life of faith and please God by having faith in the Word of God, having faith in God's Word, living by God's Word, then it says He's a rewarder. Now, those that diligently seek Him, we all know, and y'all heard me, I, I think this is my sixth time in the last couple of years to get the, the, the pleasure of ministering here, but we know that everything is a thing, and that the Lord said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. Now here's your real revelation. Y'all buckle up. I don't know if you can handle this. Everything is a thing. Susie and I are avid watchers of the wheel. Of fortune. They have columns, categories, like when they're going to final wheel, the final thing there, they call it. They say, pick a category, thing or place or this thing, and I just want to yell at these stupid people. You're stupid. Everything is a thing. And after 40 years of watching Wheel of Fortune, I can tell you that they really go out to find out what is really a thing. 
and then mix up the letters so you're trying to figure out what it is. Okay, let me get off of that. I'm just airing out some of the things I'm not particularly happy about. <clears throat> but everything is a thing. So can we just tell you that everything is under God and He's promised us that if we would seek His kingdom, that all these things will be added unto you. Your emotional things, your relational things, your financial things, your mental things, all your provision and everything will be added to you if you seek God first. So I think the first part of this message, I want you to understand that we live in a kingdom, and a kingdom has a system. How about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now, let me tell you something. There's a lot of people that, boy, I don't know about all my heart. I know, because there's so many things in your life you've given all your heart to that you don't have room for God. You know what it is to do it with all your heart. I know what it is to go after golf clubs and golf with all my heart. So for me to say I don't know what all my heart means is kind of, well, anyway, moving right along. I know what all my heart means. You know what all your heart means. And sister, when I get to go into the jail and I preach these scriptures right here, I, those guys right there that are locked up, they all know what it is to go after something with all your heart. Hello, that's why they're wearing orange. That's why they're eating oatmeal four times a day. All their heart. They went after something with all their heart and they got what they went after. This is what brings it. That's the reward. He said he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. But this world has this reward also. And when we fail God and we go against God, we get the reward for that. Because God's got a system. Every system. Now, I've worked in, uh, just, just for a few, I've worked in the school system. I've worked in the, as a chaplain. In the last 28 years, I have spent seven years behind bars, a little over seven I'm working on my dime as we speak. And in the years that I spent in, behind bars preaching in jails and prisons, they have a system. They don't even click the door till they know who I am and that I'm approved to work there and that I already know. You've been through the training that you already know the do's and don'ts of jail ministry. They have a system. They will keep letting you in as long as you obey the system, when you break the rules, what's going to happen? That door ain't clicking. They're going to tell you, I'm sorry, your name has been removed from the approved people. They have a system about it. I know that system. I ain't going to mess with that system. I'm going to keep the system. Why? Because I want to keep going in there and preaching the Word of God. And to do that, there's a system that has perks to it, but it also has penalties to it. And I've sat and dealt with some of those that said, Oh, Brother Paul, they said I couldn't come in there anymore. Can you do something about it? And I said, No. I can't do anything about it. You're the only one that can do something about that. You've already proved to them that they can't trust you. You've got a heart. You love these people. You want to preach the gospel, but you're not willing to obey the system. I've taught in college for years, and they have a certain system about it and rules for us that there's perks and rewards for keeping doing what is right. When we're, we're going to keep our job, we're going to keep teaching, we're going to have reward that comes with the system. But if we break the rules in any way, we're going to be out of the system. I want you to know, brother, I want to be in God's system. I want to be working and operating in God's system no matter where I go, what I'm doing. If I want to buy a car, I want to buy it in God's system. No matter where I live, how I breathe, where I work, I want to be in God's system. He's the king. He's got this thing set up. He's told us how to live. And I want to live that way because I want the very best of God's kingdom. Thy kingdom come. I'm sorry if I get a little worked up here. No, I really ain't. Second Chronicles 7.14, he said, here's, what, here's how it works. We pray and turn, and he hears and heals. That's his system. We pray and we turn from our wicked ways. He hears and he heals. Can I tell you, you can't throw enough money at a problem when God's already said, I ain't going to bless them. 
You can't throw enough science. You can't throw enough time. You can't throw enough of man's power. You can't throw enough of man's knowledge at anything that God said, until they turn and pray, I'm not going to hear and I'm not going to heal. I want to live in God's kingdom. How many of you had some parents that had a set of rules? You ever had any parents that had a system? You ever had any parents that said, you do that and I'm going to bust your posterior part of your anatomy? My mother had several words for it. She was world champion. I go back now and I thank my mother for every lick, every whooping. And she was good. She was a star basketball player. And then after she had five kids, she only knew one sport, whooping kids. She had this way she'd grab you by the hand and go up with it. They had this motion. I even wish I had that in golf. That's why it seems like, you know, if I can play golf at all, it was whoop the kids, you know, right down the fairway. Amen. Par five. She'd lift you up, and we'd go in circles. This little thing. I always wanted to get around the circle because she'd get a little tired after a while after we went in a circle. And the knowledge that came into me during that circle. If, you know what? Even though my ears were full of wax, it melted right out. I could hear now. I could think clearly now. I woke up out of whatever I was in that got me in that place. And it's like, I don't need that to happen again. I think I'll go take a walk because I cannot sit down. A system. You know what was the end of her system? It was kind of funny. Some of y'all might remember this. Mother would make a cake, and the cake batter was as good as the cake. And she would have this big old bowl and have her thing, and she mixed that cake all up good. And then she poured it over in a pan and scraped everything out in a pan real nice and put it in the oven. Now, we're hearing these things. We hear all this, whoop, 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 whoop. we know it's coming. We're watching Three Stooges, amen. But we know this is coming. And uh, uh, she's got this bowl, and we could hear it. And when we'd hear that oven door slam, we're all in the kitchen, five of us, trying to get some of that cake batter that's left in that bowl. Some of you kids have missed out on this wonderful thing. It begins like the Olympics. I'm just telling you, we all go for the bowl. And then we get there, and what I thought was real funny one time is that I was about, you know, I don't know how old, but I could still get the mixing bowl over my head. And so everybody's reaching and grabbing, and I thought it would be neat if I grabbed it and put it on my head and licked it from the inside. (laughs) And then trying to rescue me from the bowl, the bowl got broken. And mother came into the kitchen, and it was smack down. I think the year was somewhere around 1958, 59. Just, I just know we had an all-kitchen smackdown. Mother would grab kids, put one under one arm, throw one down, put their foot on them, and she'd get them all going, and she would go to whooping until next thing you know, they're all standing up over there whimpering and pointing at me. I'm the one that thought it was so great to put the bowl over my head. I just thought the licking came better like that. I'm sure glad I could come over here and do, y'all do some therapy on me or just lay there on the couch and tell us about it, brother. <laughs> but it's from those kind of times that after she busted us all, after I got the extra busting, after we cleaned up the mess, after we promised to get together and buy mother another bowl, and then she pulled the pan back out of the oven and got a spoon and gave each of us a spoonful of cake batter. And I can remember, I got mine last, but I can remember her words. And one for my clown. Even though that was the day I got the bust of my ever-loving life, I was reintroduced to Mother's system. Amen? And, you know, those kind of times... I've gotten bustings from God because I'm his son. And he said, as many as I love, I chase them. When you're getting off the path, you know, 
God wants to get us back on the path as quickly as possible because that's, where he, that's what he can bless. He wants to live a blessable life. He can't bless sin. He's not going to bless you going further out. He's not going to bless that. He wants you back over here where he can bless you. And that's what you want for your kids, don't you? You want everything. Don't you want to bless your kids? Listen, say it today. I want to bless my kids. I want them to be blessed, but I want them to live a life that I can bless. I got two amens and oh me. Uh, but one time when I was a youth representative down in uh, Abilene section, we had one church that's 150 miles down there just to get to, I want to find a central location for the seven or eight churches down the bottom of my section where they could have a youth rally that they could drive to. Besides that, they complained about all my youth rallies because we'd have music like Dallas Home and Praise and the Imperials, and they were upset about that. They weren't even at the youth rally to sing the uh, ancient and Christy songs. And so I thought if I give them their own rally, then they can just do their thing down there and got complained about us so much. And so I rode my three-cylinder Suzuki two-cycle. Any you bikers ever knew they made a two-cycle large motorcycle? It did not sound like a Harley. It sounded like a weed eater on steroids. <laughs> I rode that thing down. That's the longest trip I ever took on it. It's 150 miles, which is nothing for a bike ride, but on that thing, with that whiny sound, <laughs> it would hypnotize me. I, I lost all track of where I was and what I was doing. I would get off of it, walk around, slap my face, okay, and get back on it, go on down the road, maybe about 30 miles, and I didn't, you know, I didn't have all the stuff y'all have nowadays, stereo and all that. I could have been listening to somebody. But anyway, I'm going into Coleman, Texas, and there's this big yellow sign that had a big black arrow on it pointing that away. It was a 90 degree turn. I'm looking at that sign and I go right under it out to a cotton field. I was so mesmerized, I forgot where I was at, what I was doing. It wasn't a matter of sleepy, I was hypnotized. Mm. Next thing I know, it's the, the cotton had, had just been plowed and wasn't any cotton in there yet, just a plowed field. But that old bike, bum, 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 bum. And I'm out there about, I'm going to say somewhere around 200 yards out in the middle of it, whenever I finally come to myself, kind of like the prodigal son. He came to himself. So there I am with this big old two-cycle whiny bike out there in the middle of that field. So I got to get back to the highway. And I got her started back up. And I started moving, and it's going in and out of every furrow every one of the furrows in the, in a plowed field. It's a long way back to the road. I got out there in about two seconds. But now to get back, it took me about 30 minutes to do the same thing. And I will forever remember, it sure is good to keep your head on straight and keep going down the road like God wants us to because those little side trips, they can get expensive and harrowing and it always takes longer to get back than if you stayed on the road. And it always, you get out there quicker than you can get back. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Somebody say amen this morning. When we get out of God's will, it goes fast. But when we want to come back, we got to pass everything we pass going out. And it sure looks ugly when you have to face it the second time. First time it didn't look so bad. But coming back, that stuff looks so ugly. Have you ever passed a bunch of stuff coming back to God's will saying, how stupid? I think I've established something this morning. Tell me if I have about a kingdom. He's a king. And we want to live within his kingdom. And whenever we can just think about this, about living under God's system, living under God's rules, living under God's love, he promised he would teach us how to do it. He'd carry us through it. He'll be there to do it. And I can remember whenever we had a cotton field right next to our house there in Sweetwater. We, it wasn't ours. It was uh, another person's cotton field we had a cemetery everything we buried stay buried and uh, that's what we took care of uh, 
But over there, whenever, some time to time, Dad wanted to walk out there and check the cotton. He was raised on a cotton field. And uh, I, I remember he just pushed the barbed wire down and stepped over it and started walking. Well, I pulled some apart and scooted under there. I was about three or four years old, if I can remember right. And uh, I wanted to go with him. And I can remember as my dad would step across those furrows, my little body wouldn't negotiate those furrows. But dad would reach down and grab me, and I had to hold his thumb, and he had a hold to my wrist. You hear what I'm saying? He had a hold to my wrist, and he'd swing me across those furrows. And I, to this day, I can remember my daddy swinging me across the furrows. That was the neatest walk I ever took. But how many know God wants to take that walk with you, that he can swing you across the furrows. He's so much stronger than us, so much so great if we could just allow God to get us through this life we're going to hit some things that are uh, seemingly non-negotiable he said I'll make a way where there seems to be no way that don't mean it's not God's will because it's non-negotiable that just means we pray for a miracle amen we just pray for thy kingdom come thy will be done and then we got to go to this thing we've got to talk about this folks even though I'm not sure about what I'm talking about. God's power and God's glory is absolutely indescribable. The words they use in Hebrew and in Greek about His power and His glory, and when you try to trace it down, you cannot even get clean description because it's indescribable it's like when they talked about in the beginning when God made man he breathed into man and he became a living soul and that word breathe is called dunamis it was pneumatic it was God's powerful air breathing into the soul of man and man became a living soul but whenever they, they use that word dunamis, talking about an, a power that is indescribable, dynamic power. When the man, I think it was Nobel, because they call it the Nobel Peace Prize, I think he's the one that invited, that invented dynamite. But whenever he invented this explosive that was so powerful, he used the same word that it had that's why they call it dynamite. It comes from a word that means indescribable power. But even at that, he can't even touch. That can't even touch the power of God. That's just something man is able to take out of the, the, the ingredients from this earth and to form something that is so powerful. Now since then, with hydrogen and with atomic bombs and nuclear things, they have come up with some stuff that is, they don't even know how to measure what it can do. But whenever they're at the end of it, I can tell you this, God will still be more powerful. God is able and farther above to do anything He wants to do. Man can't come close. When we're praying, we have to try to bring it down to where we are. Three things we need to know. Is it God's will? God's word tells you God's will. Are y'all still with me this morning? I hope I didn't lose you. I did get out of that field, all right? In case y'all are wondering whatever happened. Yeah, I did get out of the field and... I knew a youth pastor in Coleman. I knocked on his door at midnight, and I said, I don't know what's the matter with me, but I can't go any further. Can I sleep on your couch? And I called Susan, didn't have cell phones, called Susan and slept on his couch and made it home safely. So there you go. I got that story out of the way. So y'all are not wondering, are you still out in the field? No, I'm back. They try to say that God is not omniscient, that is all-knowing. They want to say that God is omnipresent, meaning he's at all everywhere all the time from eternity to eternity then they use the word omnipotent meaning he is all power he can do anything there's no limit to God's power we try to put words on it but the first thing we have to ask is it God's will the Bible says in 1 John 5 15 if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask 
we know that we have the petition that we desire of him. If we know it's his will, if we ask anything of God according to his will, and we know he hears us, we know we have the petition that we desire him. So number one, we got to know it is God's will, and you know God's will by the word of God and by prayer. God will give you scripture. God will speak to you in prayer and will tell you. Now, next thing you need to know, are you convinced that God knows where you are? That God knows what you're going through. God knows your mental location, your physical location, your financial location, your emotional location, your relational location. Are you convinced God knows your location? Then the third thing, are you convinced that God has the power to meet your need? Are you convinced God has the power to meet your need? Now here's what we have to enter into. I believe in prayer. But I believe in the closing of this service, what God would have us to do is for some of his children to declare, I know God. But yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. The power and the glory of God is absolutely undefinable and undescribable. It is too big for us. But there's some things I don't have to know all about before I want to jump right in the middle of them because I know they're God. When you know the word of God and you know the kingdom of God, then you trust God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. There are some people that today, right here today that need a healing. Do you know it's God's will to heal you? There are some people here that need guidance. Do you know it is God's will to guide you even when it's not where you want to go? Somebody say, I just want God to guide me there. Is it God's will? Because if God don't want you there, can I tell you this? You don't want to go there. I heard one man tell me one time, he's about a 30-something-year-old bachelor. <clears throat> and he said, I said, he said, I, I really need a wife. I'm praying for you to get a godly wife. I want you to get the right one. He said, I'd like to have one now even if she's the wrong one. I said, brother, you don't know what you're talking about. You are so much better. I mean, the Bible describes that very plainly. You'd be <laughs> Never mind. You don't want the wrong one. You don't want to be out of the will of God. You don't want to go to the wrong place. You want God to show you, God, if this is not your will, I need you to take this out of my heart and get me away from this now. I need to walk in another direction. I want your will. When you're willing to do that, God will show you where to go. As long as you're saying, I'm going, God, and you bless it, as long as that's your attitude. You know, this week we... We celebrate America's birthday, 247 years. But we're one of the youngest nations in the world. 240 years old. A great revelation came to me today. America's going through puberty. That's why they don't have a lick of sense. They don't know where they're at sexually. They don't know where they're at emotionally. They don't know what they are have you ever had a kid about somewhere between 13 and 36 that was just stuck not really knowing all these things they need to know and finally somebody said well they're going through puberty I do not feel sorry for you I went through puberty in the late 60s are you with me do you know what anybody want to just read about the late 60s that's when I went through puberty so listen <laughs> Don't tell me. What you're going through now is different. Every generation has gone through craziness since man 
was created. God knows this craziness just like he's known all the craziness of all mankind. Kings rising up to kill kings is as old as mankind. Pandemics and epidemics that they don't know where they came from, how to control them, where they're going to end, they're as old as man. But today we got a God that tells his people, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then they'll hear from heaven. And then I'll heal their lands. I'm telling you today and declaring to you there's a power that cannot be described, amen, that's wanting to connect with you. There's a victory, amen. There is a glory that God wants you to experience that is so amazing. When Isaiah experienced the glory of God in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, all he could say was, Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips and a man that dwelleth among people of unclean lips. He could look inside. He looked inside himself and he realized, I'm not worthy to be in that presence. But listen, an angel from the coal of God's altar took a coal and touched his lips. And then he said, here am I, Lord, send me. Amen. He, I've been purged. I've been touched by God. I mean, listen, that's what in the 8th chapter of Revelation, it shows us a picture of the throne room of God and the lake. Amen. Right out in front of him. Amen. To where our prayers are being poured out. Amen. Before the throne of God. God, can you put yourself there today? Will you come and stand in front of this altar? Will you come stand and say, I want that. I want that power. I want that glory. I want to subject myself to his kingdom. I bring, you know, Tony Evans has this thing that I've adopted where he says, when somebody starts talking about their problems, I simply say, it seems like there's something you haven't submitted to God. It all comes back to that. There's that something that you haven't submitted or you're... Don't look at me at that tone of voice. I'm your friend. I'm a redneck just like you. But there's something that you just won't submit to God. Would you come? Would you come and stand in front of this altar? Say, God, I want to touch you. I want your glory. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Would you come? Amen. Just come stand in the altar. There's going to be others join. We're going to have worship service right down here. Sister, would you, can you spin that up? I'd ask them to cue up a song. How did I forget? He's the king of the world. How did my, how did I get off track and forget? that he's the king of the world. Would others come?